All right, here we are. Welcome to uh, episode six of a lesson before writing. And um, I, I realize I often forget to introduce myself, which uh, on the audio podcast, that maybe is a little bit of a problem. I'm Ted Morrissey, by the way, and I'm here with my co-host, Brady Harrison and Grant Tracy. It feels weird to be back together with you guys so soon. There's usually about a month between episodes, but we had so much trouble getting November uh, recorded that we just got it done last week and I hear it is a week later. So, uh, so it's, it's good to see you guys even a week later. So anyway, uh, I'll just say Brady Harrison's one of our, uh, uh, co-hosts here and his uh, book, the term between is uh, out in not a new paperback edition, but a paperback with a new cover, which is in recognition of his winning the high plains book award in October. So that's fantastic. And like I said, uh, we are moving some copies of this. So maybe, the, the award and the great reviews you've been getting have, uh, you know, kind of started to sink in out there. So that's terrific. Um, and then also here with Grant Tracy, and this is Grant's most recent release. It's a, it's a hardcover special edition of Neon Kiss. And uh, this is still the proof copy. I neglected to actually hit all the buttons to order myself copies of the book. But luckily I did hit them all and Grant got his copy uh, just yesterday, his auth author copies, I should say. But here it is. We should you should definitely check out Neon Kiss. Both these guys have new novels coming out next year, so I'm excited about that. I too have a new novel coming out, as it, such as it is. Um, speaking of me, I usually plug my most recent book, which is um, Relative Cassiopeia. But I wanted to go ahead and uh, plug this book of mine, even though it's a little bit older. This is uh, an academic book of mine, Trauma Theory as Approached to Analyzing Literary Texts. Uh, which I released in 2021 as an updated and expanded edition with readings. And this is by far my best-selling book. I can't even explain why, but I, I sell several copies of these you know, a month. Um, it seems like internationally they're particularly interested in this book. Um, I, there was a young doctoral student in Pakistan who actually was basing her entire dissertation on my work. And so we were like having conferences over Zoom and emails back and forth just to kind of talk about all that. But that was obviously very humbling and honored that to think that someone out there was basing their, their dissertation on my my research. And then just, just a couple of weeks ago, I got notification that uh, brand new books in both the UK and India cite my book. You know, and, and again, I can't even explain its popularity other than, unfortunately, maybe the universality of, of trauma and how that affects uh, writers and artists and so forth. And, I, and I, one of the reasons I wanted to kind of start with this was because the story that we're going to talk about later in the podcast mentions trauma. Yeah. So maybe there'll be a little bit of an intersection there. I also always do an older 12 Winters plug. And I'm going to plug this book, Final Stanzas by our own Grant to Tracy. This was his last book of just kind of straight literary fiction, I think, before yeah. we started publishing his crime noir. And it's a great, it's a great book. And I wanted to bring it up for a couple of reasons. One is I know some of our listeners and viewers maybe aren't crime noir fans, but if they're literary story fans or just fans of great writing, I would highly recommend Final Stanzas. It's a great collection of stories. And also there's a really cool audiobook edition of final stanzas where Grant and some other folks actually do the, the voice acting themselves. Grant is an actor among many other things. And it's a really great audio book. So that might be another, you know, something or other you want to stick in your, uh, your player when you're, when you're driving to holiday events over the next few weeks or whatever. So I wanted to plug final stanzas. Grant, do you ever have a, do you ever have a, an inkling to, to go back and write a, a sort of literary story? Or I know you're so you've already yeah. talked about three more Hayden books that you've got planned in your brain, at least. Yeah. Um, you seem to be totally immersed in crime noir. Do you ever think about writing some more literary well, stuff? I did write a recently. I submitted it to a couple of contests and it's still kind of a crime story, but I wrote it more in a literary way. So it's called a. I took it from uh, Morley Callahan's title called A Cap for Steve and mine's called A Cap for Tom. And it's based on, uh, there's a photograph that's in a James Elroy book um, of a guy who hangs himself and he's decked in women's clothes and he has a bathing cap on. And there's these cops looking at him incredulously, you know, as, as they, as, as they did back in that, in that time period. 
Um, and Elroy's just really scathing about like he just has these little sideways smug comments about it. And I thought, why not tell that story, but from a straight perspective? So um, I did a story set in Seattle with a character called Mike Carmody, who's a taxi driver. And um, the, the, the story is about this guy telling his story and he eventually hangs himself um, in, in a in a in a garage in an auto garage where he works and he puts in a request call for the cab because the cabbie has a a meeting with him and they talk there's sort of a meeting of the minds there's a connection between the two of them and um uh mike goes and finds the the body and um rather than he thinks momentarily about taking off all the women's clothes and putting on the guy's masculine clothes but then he realizes um you know, there's a reason for this tableau. It's very arty the way he arranged his suicide. So he's, he figures this fella is trying to make a statement and he honors that at the end by not doing anything but calling the police and just sitting there and waiting. And it, the the ending of the story is a shout out to Joyce. Um, I think at the end of Araby, all the lights are going off at the end. And so I invert that. And because he works the graveyard shift, the street lights are just starting to come on. And that's how the the story ends. So I think of it as a very literary story with crime elements. I don't know if that's how my audience will think, but I sent it to lit mags, not to uh, crime mags. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, you know, I, I talk about your writing as if, you know, it's either fish or fowl, but as you know, I, one of the things I love about your crime fiction is, as I've, as I've said to you in the past, you can take the boy out of literary fiction, but you can't take the literary fiction out of the boy. You know, there, there's, a, there's another dimension to your detective stories that, that, I, that I don't think I see in a lot of other kind of hard-boiled detective stories. And some of the favorite parts of your books are those parts where you your characters get a little more introspective and there's just obviously a you know a, a more kind of refined aesthetic at work in the book or whatever so uh, so yeah so i think that's great brady i was going to ask you, you you i know you've been writing these ghost stories do you find that you kind of start drifting into more literary aspects of, of, of you know, horror stories or how, how do you go about, you know, your sensibilities when you're writing that kind of story? Well, that's a great, uh, great question. And I, I uh, find, yeah, always slowing down and thinking about character and about the problems of psychology. And so when we were talking uh, in an earlier podcast, I'm, I'm not about the visceral, uh, violent, uh, you know, scary elements. It's the psychological dimension. And we had talked even before that uh, about the Gothic and what, in, you know, what I love so much about the Gothic is the psychological uh, dimensions. But um, so uh, just lately, and this is a product of uh, having been reading Grant and also my daughter has a couple of years ago started reading Agatha Christie. And, and so we were reading, we got in the habit of reading uh, some books in common. And so I've sort of been growing this uh, mystery novel, not a, not a noir, but uh, a kind of a puzzle, a who a whodunit mystery. So who knows, but uh, that's on the back burner. Uh, got a few literary projects, <laughs> uh, including, including a novel after, after a, a journey to Al Rommel. Uh, that I've already begun work on. So we'll, we'll see how it all goes. Well, you know, I uh, invented this really kind of minor character in, when I wrote my novel, An Untimely Frost, a few years ago, which is a kind of a, a, a novel based on the almost rumor, sli slightly better than rumor, that um, when Washington Irving was visiting London in like around 1830 something, he had a, a kind of quasi romantic uh, relationship with Mary Shelley. So I always thought, gosh, the, uh, you know, the, the author of like the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow and all that, it, having a romantic relationship with the author of Frankenstein, what would that have been like? So, so that was kind of the impetus of that novel. But in the, in the process of writing it, I invented this character uh, that I saw as sort of Edgar Allan Poe-like character. And in, in my fantasy world, rather than dying an alcoholic, an unknown mysterious death in the U.S. 
Instead, he went to England and became kind of an underground, you know, bohemian literate star. And so, but he isn't in the novel very much. And so for whatever reason, a few weeks ago, I thought, you know what, um, I'd kind of like to write about that character again. So I've been writing about uh, my Byron Swinford character. But, and this is why I bring it up, Brady, because my original thought was I'm going to write kind of a kind of a mystery, you know, kind of get him involved in a mystery and blah, blah, blah. And I realized this morning, I'm like, I don't even know, like, heck, seven, eight thousand words into it. And he's just wandering around the streets of London writing poems. Uh, this morning I was looking at uh, writing a, a section where I'm comparing the trinity of a church to the trivium you might find in a library. And I, I really, I'm just terrible at popular fiction. I just, I just, I just can't do it. You know, I just find myself like just spinning off into all these. So I'm like looking up, like, what was the trivium again? Grammar and rhetoric, you know, it's like, what does that have to do with this, this mystery I supposedly was trying to write, you know, when I started this a month ago? Oh, I love it. Uh, the, um, and just listening, Ted, to your description, uh, the, A Journey to Al Romal, it, it, it's structured like an adventure story. It, right. it has a you know classic adventure story plot. And so I, I think actually popular genres, well-established genres, have the possibilities for revisions and reinventions and so who knows what you might come up with in melding uh the kind of literary mind the discursive mind the the wandering through the streets mind and uh the pleasures and plot drivenness of uh, a mystery so yeah who knows i look forward to reading it yeah, well, I, I, I hope uh, I look forward to getting your book out into the world, you know, and that actually brings up an interesting issue, which um, I didn't know we were going to talk about. But here we go. One of the things you and I have talked about briefly via email was your original manuscript is just loaded with all kinds of different fonts and different styles and graphically different this, that, the other. And I, I you know, I, I told you when, I, when, when we were getting ready to start laying it out that this is going to be, this is going to be quite a trip down the old layout rabbit hole. But then, then you were asking, maybe that's too much. Maybe we want to simplify the look of it on the page. Uh, maybe that's like taking away from you know, the story. And I, I think we're kind of leaning in that direction. Have you been thinking any more about that in the, in the interim? I know I haven't given you any more pages for a while to look at, but. No, uh, well, yeah, I, I, I think, I think the simpler plan is the better plan. And I, I've been thinking about it a lot. And I think because we're interested in, in our discussions in the podcast about our processes and what, you know, what we can share with other folks, if they should be interested, it was really helpful to me in writing this multi-part novel with so many different voices to, when I was writing it, to use different fonts. It helped me map the work more effectively. And it also helped me across the trajectory. It's not a super long novel, but it's not a short novel either. And it has you know many parts and, and as I say, many characters, uh, the setting changes uh, rather abruptly by times. And so it was really helpful to me but I, I like the idea of a, a kind of uh, greater seamlessness and also trusting the reader to recognize. And, if, and it also requires that I have done my job well. well, we'll see, so that you can readily identify that even though the font is not changing, but of course the, 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 the character speaking, the voice is someone else. And so, yeah, um, it's a book in many ways in, in fragments and, and all kinds of genres, letters, diaries, uh, adventure tales. And so all of those also had their, you know, their fonts. It was a, it was a blizzard, uh, but I like the bringing it in and reestablishing a kind of relationship with the reader. You know, what do they find? What do they see? Uh, yeah, so it was okay. helpful for me in the writing stages, but yeah, now it's, now it should be simpler. Yeah. I think that's a great comparison of like the writerly, aspect versus the readerly aspect and so for you as a writer that was that was great but for the reader we don't maybe necessarily need that i, I was thinking like um i just had a master's exam with with a student she was looking at the uncanny and freud and um i asked her well what's the difference between freud's definition of the uncanny and uh the slopsky's definition of defamiliarization and and she came up with a really good answer, which is 
defamiliarization is almost more of a writerly approach. Like, how can I make the ordinary strange for the reason? So I'll come up with something, you know, that'll make it strange. So maybe we look up in the stars and and someone starts drawing a constellation with their finger, and it's not a constellation that exists. They discover a new shape and they they show it to someone. So that's a moment of defamiliarization. Like suddenly the stars <laughs> take on the take on the shape. Um, but the uncanny for Freud would be this feeling that all these gases in the universe, these stars are going to fall to the earth and destroy us. You know, like that's that's kind of the, the difference. There's a kind of state of being, an ontological state of being that goes with the uncanny, whereas the deep familiar is more of a, a writerly, a, a, a craft choice versus a, um, I don't know how to say, but a character psychology choice. I mean, that's still craft, but there's a little bit, a little bit different. So like Sam Fuller, when he was making movies, you couldn't tell by watching his films, but he used to have three different colors of chalk and he would outline it on a big board and he had red for action scenes and uh, blue uh, for love scenes and white chalk for exposition. And he wanted to make sure he had a certain amount of balance among these three modes of discourse for his uh, film screenplays. And um, then he would say, oh, there's not enough uh, not enough blood in here then he you know have a few more action scenes and one other thing uh, the, the writer joe knowles told me that one of the things she does she got this from another writer and i can't remember who it is i, I remember it's joe because she came to our school and gave a, a wonderful talk but she will when she's writing one of her ya books will take each chapter and try to come up with a couple of adjectives to describe what that chapter is about and whether or not it's downbeat or upbeat and if she has too many chapters in a row that have the same adjectives, then she needs to go in there and change some of the dynamics of the world building and, and the scene work so that it, the the novel doesn't flatline with one mood. And I, that's a rarely choice, and I don't need to necessarily know that, but as a writer, it's a good tool to have in the toolbox to use. So um, I, love, I love the idea of uh, how you use the fonts to get you in the zone but then it's not really, you know, necessary for the for the readers. You know, I I wish I could um, recall the the academic's name, but I, I read a book. Gosh, it's been a few years ago, five six years ago, um, by a, a woman who uh, was looking at like some of the like turn of the century writers who publish regularly in terms of serial editions of their work. And I remember the chapter on Henry James in particular. And um, she, you know, if I remember her thesis correctly, um, she she was making the case that Henry James, in recognition of the fact that his like stories and novellas were going to appear serially in these periodic you know, magazines, that he actually edited them with the idea of the different kind of advertisements that were going to kind of surround <laughs> his text on the page. Um, wow. And then to extend that. You know, he did that that New York edition of all of his work, you know, later in life where he re-released all of his stories and essays and novellas, you know, in, in these kind of uh, anthologized editions. And we know that he did quite a bit of editing of his work. And the implication is that when he was moving from that visual environment of the periodical to just the straight page, that that actually impacted how he was editing his stories and novellas and stuff. And I thought she made a really strong case, which, but I had never really thought about that in terms of someone like Henry James altering his text in, in recognition of the visual atmosphere that his work was going to appear in. And that reminds me of like when, when you do a reading, you have to maybe if you're if you're not a performance artist and able to you know shift between characters and make them sound different you you sometimes put in seds or she's like like because we don't have the shot reverse shot like the new paragraph starts for dialogue so it's like well who's talking now so the the reading copy is a i remember seeing her way early in my career a, a writer showed me that because i was like oh that's how you do it um because we were able to follow along and the writer just made choices to put a few she said or Ted said or Brady said whatever so that we would know uh because we don't have the page in front of us to see the block formatting and when we shift to someone else's uh dialogue so that, that's that's really helpful so yeah different formats we, we make slight adjustments yeah yeah Brady did you have anything you want to add to that 
subject or? Uh, no, uh, the, the only other thing I'll say is uh, uh, in the going with a, a standard font uh, in a journey to Al Ramel, uh, I also want to take it uh, easy on uh, the layout person, the publisher. <laughs> So well, there are, many, there are many considerations in this world. Right. Yeah, well, I remember the uh, multiple back and forths on uh, the term between when we came to uh, the, the death of the Albertan, which you do in the form of a play, at least in part. And we had a lot of different you know, runs at how are we even going to put this on the page? You know, I mean, you had some very specific ideas about how you wanted the characters' names to appear and how the how the dialogue to appear. And I, I was fine with, with tinkering with it, but I think we tried three or four or five different versions before we got to a point where you felt like you were happy with how that looked on the page, you know? So, so that was really interesting. I, I, I find that really interesting, although at the time, maybe not quite as interesting as I seem to find it now, but um, I, do, do you recall that, um, that process at all? Can you remember kind of what your thoughts were on why you might kind of prefer this versus that? Well, I, I no, I do, I do remember it. And so I think I'm also uh, thinking we're going to have some of these conversations <laughs> in the next, yeah. next uh, months. Uh, but, you know, in fact, it was, uh, and and Grant has has talk, talked about this too. And what what are our reading habits? And so, one of my reading habits when I when I, I I try to read a Shakespeare play or reread the sonnets, at least one one play or or the book of of, 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 of poems of Shakespeare's at least once a year. And some of the editions I like have a particular kind of graphic style. Like I have an old Pelican uh, 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 complete Shakespeare, complete works of Shakespeare that I uh, that we were uh, asked to get when I was an undergraduate, and I've, it's, I've toted that book around with me, you know, for now, you know, over five years, uh, ten years possibly. <laughs> uh, anyway, the look, the look of that page, like that, like that, I have read in that edition so often and for so long, and with such great delight that it, I could only see things the play section and that's exactly where i got the original formatting in my mind so yes yeah, so i i badgered you with my the, the layout of my favorite edition of the complete works of william shakespeare so it's well, not all you, know, you know what would be a really interesting i don't think you could do a dissertation on it but probably a master's thesis on the rhetorical strategies of a Canadian when they're trying to assert their will into a situation. <laughs> I, I wish I had some of those emails how you just very quietly and politely ask me, could we just do this again from scratch? <laughs> well, Grant, back me up. We are, we are uh, a polite people. Perhaps. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> certainly, certainly how our generation was raised. You know, I don't yeah, know now. Absolutely. Maybe, absolutely. Yeah. Manners and yeah. politeness and yeah that's that's how i was raised you know oh yeah absolutely absolutely you know and, and i love like i would love to see it in some of these anthologies you know um that that you, i love old pulp drawings that would be with the shadow you know what you know yeah. or the spider and like it would be so cool to have those kind of i don't know if it's charcoal whatever it's done with that you know those line those illustrations even like er, early editions of Huck Finn, I just I, I I love um artwork with. I remember years ago with my first publisher, I, I, I suggested something along those lines, and he he lost his mind, and so I just <laughs> backed away and said, "Okay, okay, cool." <laughs> like he somehow thought it belittled the prose or made it um childlike or something, and yet some of my favorite editions are those stories that had you know drawings with them so yeah is that grant are you speaking of parallel lines yes yeah, yeah the cover i mean i want i the cover of that book is absolutely stunning it's one of i mean i know that you have that painting yeah I mean, like it's it's so cool yeah gary yeah. kelly a local artist uh did that for me um i i went humbly hat in hand went to his office in downtown cedar falls he does the images that you see at Barnes and Noble, you know, in, yeah. in the copy section and in the book section, he, he does those. He's done covers for Rolling Stone. He did the Ross McDonald, uh, Lou Archer series back in the eighties, I think. Um, no nineties. Um, 
and he's he's like a local treasure should be a national treasure we, it's an amazing artist so yeah that was i was so like thank you thank you when he said he would do it and this is what makes this guy so cool like he knew i was canadian and then he went and studied canadian artists and found you know the the uh, uh ay jackson well he group came of seven there. yeah cass and the group of seven um thompson tommy thompson you know and he wanted to do something in that style. And it was just like, what a cool dude, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, stunning. Yeah. Well, so you have to go back for another edition and get uh, some line drawings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah. Or maybe I, for uh, a shoeshine kill. Whoa, that would be so cool. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and Hayden's put on a little weight, like many of us, <laughs> as we've got a little older. <laughs> And the, those um, stories are set in 70, that, that novel set in 72, the Canada Russia hockey series, the greatest moment in Canadian history for identity formation and, and cultural uh, heritage. Um, yeah, it's, uh, that would be awesome. Yes, that would be so cool. Well, I'm going to, I was about to say, I'm going to put the ball in your court, but let me say, I'm going to put the puck in your, uh, in your uh, area of the ice or whatever. I, see, I don't even know what the right terms are for hockey. No, that's good. Different. That's good. You're doing fine. Yeah. You're going to call me for icing. At least I know that much. So, <laughs> so um, we were going to talk, and let's go ahead and touch on it at least. Um, we had talked the last episode about the, the sort of workshop experience. And, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, Brady has suggested he doesn't have anything to say about it, which I don't believe for a minute. And <laughs> I'm just going to say I – I've only been teaching workshop, you know, for the last few weeks. Um, I started teaching, you know, an MFA program in 2016, I think. And when I was originally like contacting the director, who's a different director than we have now, by the way, um, you know, I, she was talking to me about, cause they have two kinds of classes, basically. They got workshop classes, and they got literature classes. And she was asking me what, asking me what kind of classes I, I wanted to teach. And my sense was she was expecting me to say workshop classes because that's almost what everyone says. And I maybe I surprised her and maybe I'm just projecting. Maybe this isn't true at all. But I said, no, yeah, really, I prefer literature classes. And so um, so I've been teaching mainly literature classes within this MFA program. Well, not mainly, but it, it, you know, exclusively. But then a few weeks ago, I was asked to teach this new kind of introductory course. And there's a workshop component. So I've really only been teaching workshop uh, for the last few weeks or whatever. But I'll just, I'll just add very quickly that the reason I preferred um, to teach literature classes uh, is because when I was working on my master's and I had to take workshop classes and literature classes, I found, for me at least, the literature classes to be much more fruitful, I felt, in terms of you know, developing my own voice and, and so forth, whereas the workshop classes, they were okay. But, you know, I, the, the first one I took when my, when my piece was, was uh, workshop was devastating. I was just depressed. I mean, it was just torn to shreds. Um, and so I, I try to make sure no one has that kind of experience. But, um, but then after that, I kind of learned to, to make better use of them with some help from my advisor who gave me some, some pretty good advice. Uh, but still, looking back, I always felt like the literature courses that I took were much more useful and beneficial to me than the workshop courses. Yeah, I, you know, for what the, the experience I had when I was in my first workshop, although it was inspiring in some ways, there are a couple of things that really bothered me. One, um, too many people wanted to collaborate with me and write my story. Like they would sort of hijack it and say, do this, do this, do this. Well, no, that's, that's not what I'm doing, you know? Um, so I found that problematic. And then the second thing was the attacks went beyond the work to being personal and it was a different era because i think john gardner in his art of fiction says something to the effect if there's a problem with the story the problems with the writer and um some people took that to heart so i, I can remember one time a workshop having one of the women in the class saying something to the effect that i knew nothing about women and so you know now there was some truth to that but did i need to get called out in front of everybody you know what i'm saying right, uh right. it's my female characters weren't you know three-dimensional blah 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 um so when i got then i had another professor who was much more nurturing and his goal which i've taken to be my goal is to have no one ever quit writing like the very first workshop i took i remember the professor saying and he was kind of a hard ass but i remember him saying 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bowling Green, where I, uh, you know, uh, did my MFA. Uh, I'm the only one still from my class that's still writing. And I thought, that's terrible. This is what this is what happens with MFA programs. Like uh, people in the workshop get beat down and, and don't write anymore. That is not what I'm going to be as a teacher. So I made it my goal to be nurturing, to never be a gatekeeper and to always find value in the work and find out what is the text. I always say text because I don't think writers always completely know what we're doing. We know, but we don't know. We have intentions, but the text is bigger than us. So what is it that the text is trying to do? And let's help the writer fulfill that. So what genre is it working in? What what direction is it going? Or maybe there's some variables at the beginning that are really promising that the, the writer dropped and let's talk about that as a possibility but it's it's never to you know make the story a grant tracy story it's to make the story whoever the writer is whose work is up for that day and i've, I've had a fair amount of success i think in giving students confidence and encouragement to keep writing so that i want it to be like tennis i, mean, I hate tennis but i'm saying <laughs> people that play tennis as a teenager play it in their 50s you know i want writing to be a carryover thing not Oh, I got beat down and now I drive a bus for a living and I'll never write again. I mean, that's ridiculous. So that that those are some of my thoughts about what workshop should be. And I think it's changed. I, I do think it's a much more nurturing environment than when I started in workshops in the 80s. Yeah. So so Brady, did you I know you don't teach workshop, at least you, you, I think that's what you're telling us. But um, did you take any workshops as a student? I know you've talked about meeting with creative writers and getting advice from creative writers about storytelling and novel writing, et cetera. Oh, well, way, way back in the day when I was undergraduate, I, I had the good fortune to take a couple of creative writing classes with uh, Rudy Weeb, who's a, a great uh, Canadian writer, you know, kind of giant uh, uh, on the Canadian literary scene. Uh, and I enjoyed those immensely, but I always, uh, always sort of felt maybe perhaps like Ted that I, you know, really, really like talking about books and, uh, and literature and how they work. And so I was always, always found myself more interested in, in my lit classes than in the creative writing classes. And so I sort of came back to being interested in creative writing, uh, sort of a, a later later on in my in my career, shall we say, uh, one thing that uh, uh, I'm going to natter on just for a second and, and not answer your question, uh, but one of the things that Grant said there's there's an analogy I think in uh, in the scholarly world and I and I know both of you know this when you get a reader's report, did did the reader make an effort to see what you were doing? Yeah. Or did they just, what would they do if they had written this article or right. this book chapter? And those kind of reports, you take from them what you can, what you think works. But I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And so the, the, the one thing that I can say, and I have, so like I say, I have very limited experience. I don't teach workshops. I haven't taken a workshop in, you know, also 10 years or more. Um, <laughs> one of the, and this goes along with what Grant was saying. One of the one of the important things I think is to try to try to work with people, but then people also have to defend themselves, even if not in the moment, because presumably in in, in workshops you you just keep your own counsel. But you have to in this process, whatever it is we're doing, you have to find your own voice and 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 have some confidence or some faith in your ability to tell your stories, your, and so of course you can learn from others. That's, that's what we do constantly, but that, that trying to find and defend and don't let, don't let somebody push you off, especially as Grant says, to the point of never, never turning the computer on again, or never, never picking up um, pen and paper again. Like that, that would be, that would be a terrible, terrible shame. But right. that, that certainly is not what the process is for. Yeah. Well, Oh, go ahead, Grant. Go ahead. I'm just going to quickly say, you know, two things. One, I'm not real big on collaboration. That's why I love working with you, Ted. Like, I send you something, you you work with it, you, you point out some stuff, but you're not like saying, well, we need to drop these whole 50 pages here and you got to do this, this, and this. And like, you know, I've, I've worked at this long enough. I remember Alice Monroe saying, you know, later in her career, into her 70s, you know, that 
she doesn't revise as much as she used to because she's mastered the craft. She's worked at it so she knows how to tell an Alice Monroe story. You know, it took her a long time, but she's got so like not that she's first draft perfect, but it's easier for her to to do stuff. So I'm I'm really uh, not big on collaboration. And the second thing is, I think this is just my feeling, and I know people disagree, and there's all kinds of folks that need workshop but i think the goal is to get beyond the workshop to not need the workshop now is that a perfect system no because there are times i'm really stuck with a story and i just give it to four or five people that i really trust and get some feedback on but i don't find a oh i'm in the cedar valley i gotta find a community of writers to hang out with and get feedback on i, I guess i just have enough confidence on my own and it's been trained over years of writing to not need the workshop, but that, that's my feeling about it is to eventually get beyond it. Right, right. Well, yeah, I had a couple of things I wanted to add. And actually, that very last thing, I'll, I'll kind of jump to that. You know, I'm a devotee of this guy back here, William H. Gass. By the no, way, no next way. year is- Ted, really? Oh, I'm, sure, <laughs> yeah, I'm, shocked, I'm shocked to hear wow. that. <laughs> yeah, it's newsflash. Um, film at 11. But uh, Next year is Gas's centenary, by the way. So we're, we've got all kinds of things in the works for that. But one of Gas's things that he, he didn't teach creative writing. He was a, his, his degree was in philosophy. And so he taught in the philosophy department, but he taught literature within the context of philosophy or maybe vice versa. And he obviously was this, you know, uh, award-winning uh, author, including a fiction, but he didn't like to teach creative writing. And, and he said that, uh, you know, he was asked about this in interviews. He says, well, you know, if, if a student writes a really bad paper about Plato, at least I've got Plato to think about, you know. And so he didn't, he didn't want to deal with like bad, you know, drafts of short stories. But the other thing that he said was that if he had any advice for, for new writers, it was to learn not to take advice, you know, to, to learn to trust your own voice and so forth. And I think that's that's really, really important. And that's kind of what I got out of my experience. My, my main uh, mentor and teacher was the uh, novelist Kent Harriff. And uh, I remember I workshopped this story. And I thought it was, you know, pretty, pretty good. Um, but my classmates just ripped it to pieces. And so then we had to submit like a, a revision based on workshop. And so I, I tried to take everyone's you know, advice into into uh, account, and I rewrote this story. And obviously, it turned out to be basically a completely different story. So I gave that to Kent, and then we had our conference a few days later. And uh, he was a very nice guy, but he is, you know, just okay. This is awful. <laughs> you, know, you can't you can't possibly take all of these different suggestions and somehow meld them into. He goes. Here's what I he goes. This is what I recommend in workshop. And uh, he said, you know, when you submit a story you probably have one or two or three places that you're a little bit suspicious of yourself. You're not quite sure they're working. Maybe the pacing isn't quite right or whatever. So, so when the workshop is going on, you're sitting there, you know, uh, speaking no evil, just listening to people. Um, listen for those, those kinds of suggestions. Anyone who has anything to say about those parts that you're already suspicious of. And that will maybe give you some useful ideas about, you know, A, are you right about that? Are you right that it's not working quite right? Or, and B, maybe it will give you some, some ideas or whatever. And I, and I found that to be, you know, the sort of the key to, to success. Now, funny story, I ended up then revising that story basically back to the original form and it ended up being like my first significant publication. So I sent it out. So actually the story that everyone tore asunder, some editor in Paris liked enough to include in Paris Transcontinental. You know, so it That's just goes. Great, yeah. That was a great yeah. journal. Yeah, I remember yeah, awesome. that. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Yeah. yeah. So um, the, the other thing I was going to key on that you said, Grant, um, Kent was a classmate of John Irving's at the Iowa Writers Workshop, um, and they stayed good friends. Unfortunately, Kent passed away about 10 years ago, cancer, but uh, but he and John Irving were good friends to the point where they like called each other regularly and talked on the phone on a regular basis or whatever. And um, he was saying that of their like group that went through the Iowa Workshop together, they were the only two who wrote much of anything after they graduated, you know, and that's like the most prestigious and the oldest, you know, workshop in the country. And to think that people go through that and they just, and, and I, I think it's a, I think it's a matter of a lot of things. I think, 
Um, the world doesn't, as Kent used to tell us, not to be cruel, but just to be honest, the world doesn't need another story. No, no one's going to be banging on your door if they haven't seen you write a story or a novel or a poem for a while. So it really has to come from within. And the world kind of it conspires against us. Um, it doesn't want us to write. You know, we have family and friends and jobs and, and all those people want us to devote our time and energy to them. And they probably deserve our time and our energy. So the, that getting off uh, you know, by yourself somewhere and working on your book, I mean, that, that really is not there's not very many people in the world who want us to do that. And so it's so easy just to not do it just to keep putting it off and, and, and doing other things, join a bowling league, you know, or, or whatever. So, so I think those are factors too. I don't know if it's the cruelty of workshop. It's just more that life is just very demanding. It really takes a lot of fortitude to keep pounding out the words on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. I, I actually, I, I'm kind of half joking, but I'm not. One of the really good things about COVID for me was I was a real productive son of a bitch. I mean, I I wrote so much because I was escaping from the reality and I had time. I didn't have to drive back and forth to campus, just turn on my computer, have a Zoom class, hey, how you doing? And then, you know, go get another cup of coffee, have another Zoom, and then write. Like, it was just, it was, that was that was the one really nice perk about it. And I got closer to my family because um, we would zoom chat every day so anyway you know that maybe that's a little familiarization but take it uncanny but taking something like um covid and turning it around and saying it wasn't that for artists it wasn't so bad like i kind of wish i kind of wish i could take a sabbatical right now and just have time to 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 write uh as much as i got done then it was it was great um and i did a i used to have a virtual coffee shop with with elizabeth my daughter and we would write two three times a week just for a couple of hours we'd zoom in she's in denver i'm in cedar falls and um we would write together it was fantastic it's a really so lots of bonding and so something good came out of it at least on that front well right i don't know that we would be doing this podcast if not for covid because it really opened up you know, I think the technology exists. Well, I know the technology existed before, but it just wasn't in anyone's, you know, frame of reference. But, um, yeah, obviously you don't want to start acting like COVID was a real godsend or something. Oh, obviously people died. I get that. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, but, but it did open up this possibility. And so, like, as you guys know, I have a weekly Finnegan's Wake group that I that I get together with. One guy's in, in Hawaii, another one's in Wisconsin. We have guest speakers that come to us from England and, and all sorts of places in Ireland, uh, all sorts of places like that. Again, uh, the technology just opened up so many possibilities that we just didn't even think about before. It never would have occurred to me to start an online Finnegan's Wake group before yeah. COVID just suddenly opened our eyes to the possibilities. I think there was a was there an article today in the was it in the Times? It was in my news feed anyway, uh, that a Finnegan's reading group started uh, page one, 1995 or something, and they just got done. <laughs> well, one of the guys in my group was in that group originally. Oh, OK. And the leader of that group actually interviewed me about Finnegan's Wake in my group uh, a couple of months ago. And that that interview is on YouTube. So, yeah, there's been all kinds of cross connections between that group. And, and, and my little group. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's something else, that book, let me tell you. <laughs> well, speaking of something else, maybe we should turn to our featured story. Um, as uh, loyal viewers and listeners of the podcast know, we have a featured story each episode. Uh, I, uh, I find something and send a copy to these guys, and, and so we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, so, so this is a little bit older. Uh, normally, I try to have something like piping hot, fresh out of the literature oven, but this is from uh, Gulf Coast, which is a very well, you know, uh, respected journal. And uh, like I said, it's a little bit older. Um, I can find the. So this is summer, fall, 2022. So you know, not terribly old. Uh, and then um, the story that we're going to look at was the winner of the 2021 uh, Barthelme Prize, obviously named after Donald Barthelme, and maybe we'll talk more about that in just a little bit here. But it's uh, 
by a writer named uh, Sophia Stid, I guess, S-T-I-D or Steed, something like that. And um, just a little bit of backstory here. What we got done with the last uh, episode, uh, I think it was Brady said, you know, try to make sure you send us something short. <laughs> We're grading final exams and this is kind of a crazy time. So I, I was kind of on the lookout for a shorter piece. And this is just a a, a a page and a half in, in this edition. And in fact, when I saw that it was the Bartholomew Prize winner, um, you know, Bartholomew was known for his very short short stories. He wrote hundreds of them and, and, and hundreds of them were published, I think, in the New Yorker just by itself or whatever. And so I got to looking because um, the Bartholomew Prize is open to flash fiction, prose, poems, and micro essays of 500 words or fewer. So those are the ram ramification or the the the, the different parameters, and uh, this is a, a a short piece called "Once Again I Fall Into My Family Grave," and I I don't I don't know that it's a flash it's a piece of flash fiction. I think it's probably more of a prose poem, but I definitely you know gravitated toward it you know initially because of its brevity, but when I started reading it. You know, I just really fell in love with the language, and I'll I'll bring it back briefly to my my idol William Gass, because you know he was much more interested in language than he was plot and characterization and all those kinds of things. And in his um, he wrote this essay toward the end of his life. I think he was like 87 when he wrote it uh, about his his techniques, and he talked about his seven um, his seven quirks things that he did as a writer. And one of them is what he called jingling. And that's the, the inclusion of poetic devices, what we normally think of as poetic devices in prose. And this story is very much representative of that, this prose poem or whatever it is. And I'll just, I'll just read the, the opening paragraph um, and then we'll, we'll kind of see what, uh, what you all had to think of this a little brief uh, thing. Again, this is Once Again I Fall Into My Family Grave by Sophia Stid or Steed. And again, this is the winner of the uh, 2021 Bartholomew Prize. And it begins In my blood, a continent, all the warring countries almost reconciled. They breathe together as they weave through the marbleized muscle of my heart taking their communion of oxygen. Amen. My blood, a Catholic mashup, one long mass in the mother tongues of all my grandmothers, languages I pretended not to understand until I didn't understand. In the playroom in those years, I still dreamed in other languages, presided the old trunk we called the war room, packed by my grandmother's family fleeing a country ridden with war. And so in the next you know, few paragraphs, uh, Sophia uh, talks about the two different grandmothers and being uprooted by war and the deprivations of, of starvation and, and violence and all those kinds of things. And it, it, it's not a traditional story in the sense of having a well-defined plot. There are, of course, characters, and again, I, I use that, that, that term kind of tentatively because I think this is more of a prose poem than in a piece of fiction per se. Um, but uh, again, her, her use of poetic devices really stood out to me. Like, like in that um, little paragraph there, you know, if you listen for it, there's all kinds of alliteration and assonance and echoing of, of things. You know, it begins with a continent uh, then we've got countries reconciled, and then we keep going in that paragraph, and we got references to, to Catholic, with, which then plays with that sound. We've got um, repetition of, of P's and M's. And one of the things I really like is that last uh, line, last sentence, where she says, uh, presided the old trunk we called the war room packed by one grandmother's family fleeing, a little alliteration there, a country ridden with war. So we take war room and we end the line with ridden with war. So we reverse the, the two uh, consonant sounds and so forth. And, uh, and then in the next paragraph, I'll, I'll stop talking after this. I'm not going to read the whole paragraph, but the line, the, what line that blew me away was, eyes closed, lips slick with shook, shocked cream. 
You know, it's just a beautiful use of language. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop yammering and see what you two thought of, of this little piece. Yeah, I uh, I loved it. It's, it's, it's sort of stunning. And I agree, my senses of, uh, of a prose uh, poem. And uh, Ted, as we had the experience in our previous uh, podcast, the, the line that you just read, uh, uh, is one that I also underlined, and uh, it's it's rather remarkably written. I think um, I don't I don't know what the difference is between a microfiction and a prose poem. Perhaps, as you say, the, the where the emphasis is, uh, this seems so clearly driven uh, by language, and there's no there's no dialogue, uh, and yet there's dialogue, and yeah, it's a uh, there's something in the absolute compression of this that uh, makes it have a rather in, rather incredible impact and the seriousness of the subject matter uh, so deftly handled and so evocative uh, and and we see the uncle and we see the aunt um, in kind of shocking ways yeah it's a it, it's a well-chosen winner uh, yeah. I would say, I think the, the readers for the Bartholomew prize, uh, uh, you know, not knowing the other, uh, submissions, but they certainly found a gem. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, it really rang true to my experience, um, as someone whose ancestors came from Macedonia. Um, when I was a kid, I could speak two languages, but because I got teased at school, I, I came home at one point and said, I don't want to speak that language again. And I can't speak it. I can't speak Macedonian, but I could up to about four. So I'm sure I must have dreamed in Macedonian, um, but I can't anymore. And so that really kind of kind of hit home with me. And I can remember all those arguments about I'm Macedonian, I'm not Greek and all that sort of infighting. You know, Alexander the Great was the great. He wasn't the Greek. Don't call him Greek. He's Macedonian. Um, these sort of fights because they're all always be someone in the family lineage that would say they were Greek and that did not sit well because you don't claim Greek heritage or Macedonian. And, um, you know, similarly, uh, there was gypsy blood in, in, in my background, but that was sort of repressed. Ooh, that's scary stuff. Uh, kids. Um, so like when I read that, I was like, Oh my God, this is like, so on the mark. And then that idea of debt, that debt you owe to the whose shoulders you're standing on. I feel that every day of my life. I'm standing on the shoulders of my my grandpa who came to this country and brought in uh, other refugees and, you know, was active in his church, but, you know, struggled to make a living and ended up running a mom and pop grocery store. My other grandpa had a little diner by the railroad depot and, you know, they worked, they worked in, incredibly hard, didn't get to go to college, didn't have the advantages i have but that's that that weight of debt and i think of that one story about the uncle and the way he handles it is eating all these high calorie things and getting like he he can't handle it like there's a way in which the the weight of that is so much that he puts on weight i mean pardon the pun but it's that that i think it's paragraph three that that paragraph yeah. just blew me away um and then finally the the story about the butter i in a different context but um i've heard from members of my family that served in the military they didn't get butter and they came home and one of the first things they did was they'd eat a whole stick of butter like it was just something you, you didn't get with your rations you know so uh like there's this sort of going without and so that whole scene with the like she describes the grandma is like bayonet thin which i thought was was brilliant and um and the way she's you know eating that butter and i just yeah the the the, the the want i mean there's just so many connections i had with this piece it, it's so, uh, aside from all the wonderful stuff you guys said about language and, and it's so well written it just really hit me in the heart i i thought it was fantastic yeah i agree yeah. it's 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 a uh is a as new world people i i wonder if this story doesn't connect to to a lot of folks just as grant says you know could certainly see our families, my family's various experiences. I mean, folks, those, my family's folks came to the new world to, because they were starving or someone wanted to kill them. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I mentioned my trauma theory book. And of course, this poem references trauma literally, um, in addition to just sort of exploring it. And uh, what got me started, um, my, my book uh, is a revision of my doctoral dissertation. And what I was looking at was, I was interested in postmodernism, uh, which is a you know, literary movement, which we associate with the latter half of the 20th century. But I'm also a medieval enthusiast, especially the poem Beowulf. And Beowulf is collect clearly a most postmodern text. And you can look back and you can find postmodern uh, stories. You know, I mean, heck, the Bible is filled with postmodern stories. And so obviously it's not a, a creative phenomenon limited to the latter half of the 20th century. So I started kind of digging around. And my dissertation is really more psychology, particularly neuropsychology and history than it is literary analysis. But um, what, what I kind of came up with and, and, and discovered was that someone who has been traumatized, the, the trauma wants to, to get out. It, it, it needs to be told. And yet it can't be told in a sort of logical, uh, clear kind of way. And so the postmodern voice, as we think of it with its you know, kind of, uh, kind of undefined plot, multiple voices, the use of kind of specialized language, uh, repetition of images and so forth. Those are all telltale signs of trauma. So like a psychologist working with a trauma victim, you know, the, 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 the person who's been traumatized, they, they tell their story to try to get it out and to make sense of it, but it comes out in bits and pieces. And again, there's repetition and, 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 uh, you know, disassociation and all those kinds of things. And so, um, so, so I'm really interested in that kind of voice. And so this piece, prose poem or whatever it is, is clearly, you know, representative of that kind of idea. Uh, I mean, it's not a, a straight, you know, clear narrative with a, with a well-defined plot conflict and resolution. I mean, like you say, there's characters, but they kind of pop up and they kind of mirror each other and so forth. And so it seems that um, that it's a kind of a genuine representation of, of what uh, someone who has been traumatized, how they kind of tell their tale. And there's just one last point. Um, because of that, because of the fact trauma wants to be told, I, I discovered, I, you know, I taught mainly high school for all those years and my seniors, I would ask them to, uh, to write a, a what I call a moment of clarity essay. And they could write anything they wanted, but it, it was about a, a point in their life uh, already at age 17 or 18 where they suddenly understood something either about themselves or about a relative or about the world, how it works. And some of them wrote about kind of happy stuff, but vast majority of them wrote um, about some sort of trauma in their lives, you know, divorce, uh, grandparent who passed away, you know, a father who was injured or lost their job or, or something like that. Because given the option, you know, trauma wants to, to, to make a, to make a, a, a you know, a, its presence known. Um, but here's the thing, the way trauma wants to be told is, is completely in contradiction to what a, usually we think of as a well-organized, clear, sort of narrative essay. So trying to use a sort of traditional rubric um, to assess a trauma narrative is, is you know, they, it just doesn't work. And by the same token, whoever was judging this piece, they obviously weren't dead set on having a clearly defined plot and so forth. In fact, we're, we're told that uh, who, the, who the judge was who chose it, they probably deserve, deserve a little bit of a shout out themselves here. Um, Molly McCauley Brown, she has a little section here where she uh, explains kind of what she liked about this piece, but I'll, I'll, I won't read that necessarily. I know I've been nattering on here, so I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts about any of that stuff? Well, I, you know, um, I think it, it goes back to our conversation earlier about workshop. I mean, obviously, not just the judge, but whoever the early readers were for this, um, whoever put this forward had the ability to um uh, empathize with the work instead of bringing prescribing what the work ought to be and um you know like it comes back to the way i think workshops should be run so kudos for the whole competition committee 
and uh, the early re I would assume there were probably early, early readers that would, you know, narrow it down before sending it on to the finalist judge for um, having the courage to see something that's different and find the value in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree. I'm just looking back at the sentences and just uh, Ted, uh, what you were saying about the writing epigenetic echo of empty. And then the next word is amen. It's uh, yeah. stunning. Uh, in, in terms of trauma theory, uh, I, I have no expert, but I, I'm going to get up to speed a little bit. Next semester, one of my uh, uh, graduating seniors, undergraduates, doing a capstone project on uh, uh, trauma in literature. And uh, so I, I, met, I might have made mention of uh, a certain book by a, a guy named Morrissey. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll be able to report back in more detail. Uh, I hope in about uh, in another semester or so. Well, you know, I, I'm actually wrapping up one of my favorite courses to teach, which is on experimental literature. And a lot of the pieces we read are seem to be, um, you know, the result of, of trauma for the writer. And it makes perfect sense because, as I say, trauma wants to be told, but not in a logical sort of traditional way. So that kind of forces the writer to find kind of non-traditional, you know, experimental, whatever you want to call them, methods for telling the tale. And uh, so it really, you know, so, so basically all, you know, all bets are off in terms of how the, the piece might, might what, what form it might take, you know, and, and the use of visual elements and, and all kinds of things are, are commonplace, you know, in that kind of writing. And like I said, not always, but oftentimes it seems to be a, a piece as the result of some traumatic experience. Yeah, and you just don't know, like, with my my Hayden Fuller, as I, I mentioned this in the, the 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 new intro I wrote, I had no idea that one of the pulse lines was going to be the abuse in his past. It's not even in the first novel, but somehow in the second novel it announced itself, and then I realized so many of the choices that I was making as a writer and that Hayden was making as a character and his responses to things were because of that trauma. It was already there, but my psyche wasn't ready to face it yet. And so I was able to start dealing with it in the second novel. And I'm sure it grows out of the trauma I experienced as, as a kid growing up in a rather dysfunctional household. So, um, yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's, you just don't know when it's going to hit. And I think that's why, Ted, that your book is pop. Like I have so many students that write about trauma. It's, it's amazing. Um, and I know we've got courses now by faculty members of mine that are doing stuff with trauma and they're tying it into our nursing program because um, we have a new nursing program we're starting and, you know, tr you know, in medical field. And so they're uh, they're doing a course on trauma and, and nursing. And yeah, so it's a burgeoning field, I think. Well, you know, speaking of that, I mean, medical writing. Uh, is a whole genre within itself. I mean, there's a lot of folks who are either in the healthcare field or they've had some encounter with, uh, you know, with illness, et cetera, or accident. And so they write about it, poetry, fiction, essays. And the, Bel the Be Bellevue, Bellevue, Review, Bellevue Literary Review, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, they, they specialize in that. That's what they publish or, or works about, you know, injury, accident, illness. And, and I, they published one of my, I wrote a sonnet about um, the death of my father and how it affected my mom. So it's sort of the grief and trauma that she was going through after 60 some years of having someone at your elbow and suddenly they're not there anymore. And Bellevue published that little sonnet, which I really appreciated. Uh, so yeah, so that, yeah, that's a whole field in and of itself. Now, let me, while I still kind of got the, the screen here, let me, I, I don't want to forget to read Sophia's a contributor's note. And I have not looked her up online because well, obviously we kind of we kind of rushed this episode, so I didn't research her as much as I might normally. But the contributor's note at the back of the journal says, uh, Sophia Stid or Steed is a writer from California. She is the Ecotone Postgraduate Fellow at UNC Wilmington where she teaches creative writing and serves as an associate editor for Ecotone. She received her MFA in poetry from Vanderbilt University. Her micro chat book, Whistler's Mother, colon, an essay, is out now in the Inch series from Bull City Press. All right, so I'm sure, like I said, this, this was the 2021 winner, so I'm guessing that she's probably produced all kinds of additional 
wonderful stuff in the meantime. All right, so um, we probably want to uh, wrap things up here. I really appreciate you guys uh, being available so soon after our last podcast. Who knows when we'll be able to do the January podcast, but we'll have to figure that out. But just as we always do, uh, maybe I'll go to you, Grant, first to see if you have any kind of concluding thoughts uh, to leave with our our listeners. Um, no, I, 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 get, I mean, maybe I was a little bit hard on workshop. If you're the kind of person that needs that, to keep writing, then that works for you. I mean, I don't want to be, I think everybody has their own way of approaching things. And so whenever I bring up things about process or whatever, um, so maybe some people need those writing community and it keeps them going and, and bless them. Good. That's, that's how you roll. Then that's how you roll. But for me personally, I, I'm more of a, a loner writer. I, I, I like working alone and um, trusting in my own impulses and instincts. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I, I completely agree with you. I think for a lot of people, it's very, very important. And I and I, I think that for one thing, like as you kind of suggest, a lot of people just need the structure to kind of, they, they, they think of themselves as a writer, they want to be a writer, but lo and behold, they're really not writing anything. And so it literally kind of forces them to put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard. Uh, whereas, you know, like you, I'm sure, and Brady, I've never needed that sort of, uh, you know, encouragement. I just write all the time regardless. But I think there are some people who really benefit from that. So that's a great point. Brady, what are your kind of final thoughts here? Well, uh, so t two things. And so the first goes back to uh, the the previous podcast, I think. And, and so I'll say it again, because it's stuck with me so clearly. If you want to do this thing, if you want to, if you want to turn on your computer or pick up a piece of paper and a pen, you have to have the rhino hide. But then in the product or in the, in the context of our discussions today, we have to we have to learn, we have to read all you have to read all the time. And you have to you have to be willing to have some criticism uh, come your way, and you have to have some flexibility of mind and 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 spirit uh, to handle it. But also, you have to stand your ground. Yeah, like you have. I mean, what what is the point if you're not following through on your own vision, your own? You have something that you want to say in the way that you want to say it. Yes, you have to learn. Yes, you have to accept criticism. Yes, you have to be open. But in in a in a very serious, essential way, you have to be who you are. You have to you have to stick to your own vision. So yeah, Rhino Hyde, stand your ground, but not with like a handgun and all that stuff. I'm not talking about that. stand your artistic ground. Yeah, yes. there you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that. I, you know, I think we should end on that because that is so well said, Brady. I really appreciate your wrapping all that up in such a succinct and, and profound kind of way. So, I really appreciate you guys uh, logging on this morning. We'll obviously have to talk about uh, when we'll get together for January, and uh, I'll be in touch with you individually about your various projects we're working on. So, I'm about to hit a stop here. But thanks, uh, listeners and viewers out there, for tuning in, and we will see you hopefully in just a few weeks.